What's up, everyone? My name is Jasmine. On today's episode of The Slain Project, we're going to be talking about the case of Patricia Yellowrope. She was murdered in 1998 by the Green River Killer. And in this video, I'm going to go over what led up to Gary Ridgway's arrest and his confession to killing her. And I'm not going to dive too deep into Gary's story because it's just way too much to fit into this video. But three things to know about him are that, number one, when he was younger, he developed a sexual attraction and hatred towards his mother. Number two, he gained a hatred for prostitutes while overseas in the Navy because he claims that they gave him STDs. And number three, after he killed his victims, he had sex with some of the corpses. And if you would like to see more videos on missing and murdered Indigenous people, click that subscribe button and the notification bell. Now let's get right into it. Gary Ridgway held Seattle in a grip of terror from when his first victim showed up in the Green River in 1982 until his arrest in 2001. Sex workers and young runaway girls were his targets and they made easy prey for him. He knew that the streetwalkers would be easy to murder and that no one would really come looking for them. And back in the day, mostly all missing youths were labeled as runaways and their locations also were not pursued by law enforcement. Gary's logic on the matter about no one looking for his victims was mostly true until the body counts and clusters became too much to ignore. It soon became apparent that there was a serial killer roaming the Seattle area and King County. In July and August of 1982, his reign of terror began when five bodies were found in and near the Green River. These findings are what dubbed him as the Green River Killer. He would soon expand his dumping grounds to various areas around King County. The SeaTac area was a popular hunting spot for him. He picked up a 17-year-old sex worker named Marie Malvar on April 3, 1983 on Pacific Highway South. Her boyfriend slash pimp named Robert Woods followed his truck but eventually lost it. Marie never was seen alive after this day. Robert went and told Marie's dad and they searched relentlessly for the truck. They eventually spotted it and notified police. They went to the house and Gary Ridgway was the resident. And he said that he did not know what or who they were talking about. Gary had even taken a polygraph in 1984 and passed. And with no evidence of a crime, the investigators could not pursue charges. But this is what put Gary on the map of the Green River Task Force. Another incident would lead investigators with the task force questioning him again. There was a woman named Rebecca Gordway that is the only known survivor of Gary Ridgway. He picked her up for a date in 1982 and Gary took her into the woods. He had his pants around his ankles and was unable to show any type of arousal. He then attacked her but Rebecca was able to get away because he could not chase her with his pants around his ankles. She reported this to police and they tracked him down because he had shown her his work ID to gain her trust. Gary said he choked her in self-defense because she had bit his penis. The police bought this and did not arrest him. Now Rebecca had waited two years to tell her story because she thought that no one would believe her. Investigators believed he was responsible for a lot of the deaths and disappearances in the area, but they had no way to prove it. A search warrant on his home was obtained in 1987. Marie Melvar was also still missing at this time. She was last believed to be at his home. Another witness also came forward and picked Gary out of a photo lineup for being connected to another disappearance. The investigation always seemed to point back to Gary. During the search warrant, various items were collected including carpet fibers, ropes, paint samples, plastic tarps, bone fragments, and even a book on the Green River Killer. At this time, a saliva sample was taken from Gary and preserved for future use. In 1987, DNA was in its infancy. This is also the year that DNA was first used in a criminal case to convict someone. A man from Florida named Tommy Lee Andrews was convicted of rape after his DNA was found on the victim. In the meantime, the bodies kept piling up and the missing women continued around the Seattle area. 
investigators desperate for answers went back to review arrest records of sex workers to determine who was still around and who has not been arrested recently. They came upon another possible victim, a native woman named Linda Louise Jackson. She was never actually reported missing by anyone who knew her. When detectives got a hold of her family, it was discovered that she had not been heard from in 10 years. They pinpointed her disappearance to May 1983. Not much is known about Linda. On her page on the Justice for Native Women website, a woman commented that she is her adopted sister. She went on to say that Linda was born on the Mescalero Indian Reservation. The Mescalero Apache are located in New Mexico. On her NamUs page, there are eight Jane Doe exclusions. If you remember Linda or have any information, please contact the King County Sheriff's Office at 206-296-4155 and refer to case number 94-091386. In March 2001, technology and science was about to catch up to Gary. The DNA swab taken from him in 1987 was submitted for processing at the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab. In September 2001, he was determined to be a match to DNA profiles taken from three of the Green River Killer victims. Investigators wanted to make sure everything was in order before they made an arrest. On November 16, 2001, Gary was caught soliciting an undercover cop posing as a prostitute on Pacific Highway South. He did not want his wife notified that he had been arrested. Surprisingly, he told authorities to call the Green River Task Force because they knew him well. Gary was released after this arrest while investigators continued to work. About two weeks later on November 30th, 2001, Gary was arrested while he was leaving work at a Kenmore factory where he painted semi-trucks. With the DNA hits on semen and pubic hairs, along with paint chips found on some bodies, investigators had enough evidence and confidence for a conviction. In all, Gary was initially charged with seven counts of aggravated first-degree murder, which was only a fraction of his total suspected kills. There was not any evidence to prove he was the killer on at least 42 other cases. These cases would remain unsolved unless a confession was made. Shortly after Gary was arraigned on the seven murder charges, his attorneys contacted the prosecutor and asked if the death penalty would be taken off the table if he pled guilty to the seven murders and the additional 42 that could not be officially linked to him. In June 2003, it was decided that he would plead guilty to all murders in King County and to show investigators to the bodies of his undiscovered victims. He would also have to plead guilty to any more additional bodies discovered later. This deal only encompassed bodies found in King County. With this deal, more of his victims could be identified and more bodies could be recovered. If he were to confess to any murders outside of King County, he would be put up for the death penalty, and he was very careful not to admit to any outside murders. He is believed to have victims in the Tacoma area, and some of his victims have even been found in Oregon. He claimed to have moved bodies there to throw off the investigation. It is even suspected that he picked up some victims in the Portland area but we will never truly know because he will not admit to this or else he will get the death penalty. It was also believed that he had only killed victims from 1982 to 1985 when he remarried, but this would soon be disproven. He did, however, admit that he continued to solicit prostitutes well into the 1990s, but claims he did not harm them. But he also was picked up trying to solicit right before his arrest in 2001. Investigators wanted to test Gary Ridgway and his accuracy of the victims he claimed to kill. They began to show him pictures of his suspected victims and began to drive him to locations where they found these victims. 
He elaborated on a few of the murders and showed investigators where to find the bodies. Marie Melvar was one of his victims recovered at this time. As part of investigators' accuracy check, they brought Gary to some false sites where bodies were found, but they did not believe he killed them. At all of the false sites, he did not admit to any activity except for one of those locations that was in South Park in King County. He said that he dated once at the site, but never assaulted anyone at the location. Gary was brought to the false sites on July 9, 2003. And on July 22, 2003, after an interview, Gary began to speak about a victim that he vaguely remembered at the South Park location. He had killed so many women that he could not keep track of his actual victim count or where he disposed of them. He offered this information on his own and no prior information or suggestion was given to him or his attorneys. The interview that preceded his confession had nothing to do with the location in South Park or the victim he admitted to killing there. Gary knew that he must reveal all his murder victims for his plea deal to be valid. He very well may have been spooked after investigators brought him to the South Park site and thought they would figure out he killed someone there. He was afraid of receiving the death penalty. Gary did not reveal a whole lot on July 22nd. He could not remember what car he drove at the time, if the woman was clothed or naked, which was strange because all of the other victims were nude or nearly nude. He also said that there was a lot of glass on the ground and some blackberry bushes. Crime scene photos of where the body was found in South Park included glass shards on the ground near the body. He would reveal more details to a forensic psychologist and would continue to reveal more and more details in subsequent interviews with authorities. Gary continued to say that his memories were very vague, but provided details that only the killer would know. The woman he confessed to killing was named Patricia Yellowrobe. The following is what little is publicly known about Patricia and her encounter with Gary Ridgway. Patricia was born on April 7, 1959. She was Chippewa Cree and was an enrolled member of the Rocky Boy tribe in Montana, which is near the town of Haver. She was a divorced mother of three children when she ended up living in the Seattle area. She struggled with alcohol, drug abuse, and was known to participate in prostitution. On Tuesday, August 4, 1998, the owner at All City Wrecking in South Park located at 9328 Des Moines Way in Seattle locked up his business and closed the gate for the night. He did not return to work the next day, but returned to work on Thursday, August 6th. The owner then discovered Patricia's deceased body on the outer edge of the parking lot near some tall bushes. She was fully clothed and wearing a pair of boots. Patricia was 38 years old at the time of her death. Her body was taken to the King County Medical Examiner for autopsy. No evidence of significant injury was found and there was high levels of alcohol and controlled substances in her system. Her cause of death was listed as acute combined opiate and ethanol intoxication, including no evidence of injury and possible accident. Her family mourned her death and buried her back home on the reservation at the Rocky Boy Cemetery. They were notified that she overdosed and they accepted this. They did the best they could to move on in life without her. Since she was found dead in 1998 from what was believed to be an overdose, she never was suspected to be a victim of the Green River Killer. Her family was shocked to learn that she was one of his victims. They had to relive the trauma of her death yet again, but this time it was more painful than it was before. According to Gary Ridgway, he picked up Patricia for a date and they had sex in the parking lot of the wrecking lot. They were in the back of his truck and he said that she would not let him get behind her during sex. He then got mad when she would not spend extra time on him so he could finish his sex act. 
He then said that she redressed and he did not want to pay her because he did not finish. So he strangled her when she was about to get back in his truck. He then said she urinated when he strangled her, but this was not confirmed when her body was found. He then tossed her body to the side and drove away. Gary pointed out the location where her body was found when shown a picture of the parking lot as it appeared in 1998. He also could not identify Patricia from a photo when she was alive, but recognized a photo of her when her body was found. Gary admitted that this murder was unusual for him because he did not plan on doing it. It was a spur of the moment decision. He always made sure to tell investigators that his memories were quote unquote vague, but he eventually told everything he remembered. Also, Rebecca Gord Gway, the woman who got away from him in 1982, stated that Gary was having troubles with being aroused during sex. This could be a reason why he had the impulse to kill. He blamed Patricia and tried to kill Rebecca over his underperformance, but biologically, it was Gary who was having issues. This could also be the reason why his semen was not found on Patricia's body. There were slight traces from her vaginal swab and a pubic hair, but Gary was excluded from being the donor. When the medical examiner was questioned as to why evidence of manual strangulation was not present, they said that it was possible that Patricia's high level of intoxication compromised her ability to withstand a few seconds of asphyxia. But her family has stated that when they viewed her inside her casket, that her face appeared to be bruised and they thought she had a black eye. There should have been more effort into the investigation of her death at the time if there was evidence that she was beaten. When Gary was sentenced in December 2003, his victims' families had their chance to speak. Many were angry and some were forgiving. A letter from Patricia's dad was read and he said that he at first wanted the death penalty but later changed his mind. He said that it would be a luxury for Gary to get a lethal injection. For him to be administered drugs and fall asleep forever was too good of a death for Gary because it was a peaceful way to die that most people wish for. He wanted Gary to wake up every day in his cell in fear for his life in prison. Gary was eventually convicted of killing 49 women and he received 49 consecutive life sentences. There are more likely many more victims of his who have not been identified as belonging to him. There are also many missing women who are believed to be his victims who have never been found. His true body count is unknown, but he is suspected of killing up to 70 women. Washington State Department of Corrections lists him as being an inmate at the Washington State Penitentiary located in Walla Walla, Washington. His current age in October 2022 is 73 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you knew Patricia, please share any memories of her down below. And I will see you in my next video.